The Techno-Optimist Manifesto is a 5,000-word essay by billionaire and Silicon Valley venture capitalist Mark Andreessen. I think we need to have an eye on what those Silicon Valley people are up to, so let's have a look. Andreessen is a software engineer by training. He developed the first widely used web browser called Mosaic, in case anyone can remember this. He's later had his hands, or money really, in a lot of companies that paid off handsomely, including but not limited to Facebook, Twitter, Skype and eBay. He's now one of two partners at a venture capital firm, so basically they're investing into startups hoping to hit big. He is an estimated net value of $1.7 billion. I'm telling you this so just you can put the following into context. Andreessen starts his manifesto by complaining that someone is lying to someone about how technology is bad. Then he declares, I'm here to bring the good news. We can advance to a far superior way of living and of being. It is time to be techno-optimists. Techno-optimists believe that societies like sharks grow or die. So they stop growing and die. Not sure that metaphor works as intended. We believe everything good is downstream of growth, like the chemical industry polluting rivers, or more like trickle-down dollars that by the time they arrive have turned into food stamps. The only perpetual source of growth is technology. Before the technology, there needs to be knowledge. It's really knowledge that's the source of growth. Give us a real world problem and we can invent technology that'll solve it. Well, the real world problem that he has is all the people who disagree with him. And it doesn't look like he's got the technology to solve that problem, does it? We believe free markets are the most effective way to organize a technological economy. Good old neoliberalism. We believe the market economy is a discovery machine, a form of intelligence, an exploratory, evolutionary, adaptive system. Ah, now that is interesting. I actually mostly agree with that. Except that market economies don't optimize resource distributions just magically on their own. They need some framework to make sure they work as desired. This is why <clears throat> we have antitrust laws and why there should be a tax on carbon and so on. You really can't have a market economy without some way to enforce market rules. Centralized planning is doomed to fail. The system of production and consumption is too complex. True for the time being, but as technology advances, it'll be able to solve increasingly complex problems. So let's talk about this again in 100 years. David Friedman points out that people only do things for other people for three reasons, love, money or force. Love doesn't scale, so the economy can only run on money or force. Love doesn't scale. He writes that so confidently. But the more economically prosperous civilizations have become, the more humans have begun to care about other living beings. Genders, races, nationalities, animals, indeed the entire biosphere. There's even a name for it. It's called the moral circle expansion and is an idea that goes back to the philosopher Peter Singer in the 1970s. We believe markets are generative, not exploitative. Exploitative. Nothing exploitative at all about working three jobs and still struggling to pay rent, says American billionaire. We believe the techno-capital machine of markets and innovation never ends, but instead spirals continuously upward. I've been wondering what this reminds me of. It's the Catholic profession of faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, spiraling continuously upward. The techno-capital machine makes natural selection work for us in the realm of ideas. It's not a natural system, it's a man-made system, and it'll only work if the rules of selection are set up suitably. Humans, for example, are terribly bad at integrating information about the long-term future into their everyday decisions. 
decisions. The libertarian free market ideal assumes that we do that when in reality we don't. No one stands at the gas station future discounting the social cost of carbon. This is why a lot of nations leave the really long-term investments to governments. Yes, that's inefficient. Yes, a free market could do it better but simply doesn't do it. Also, venture capitalists are profiting very nicely from government investment, so maybe he shouldn't overstress the free market thing so much. We believe intelligence is the ultimate engine of progress. Intelligence makes everything better. Many of the most intelligent people in the world contribute surprisingly little to progress. Think chess masters or Ed Witten. By my personal experience, it's the upper middle class of intelligence that makes things happen, like Bill Gates or Elon Musk, not the Ed Witten chess master sort of intelligence, more the getting shit done sort of intelligence. Anderson then goes on about how artificial intelligence will make everything better, but we've heard this all before, so I'll skip it. Societies thrive with energy supply too, but nothing new either. Then comes a section on abundance where he writes, We believe Andy Warrow was right when he said, What's great about this country is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same things as the poorest. A Coke is a Coke and no amount of money can get you a better Coke. I once spent an afternoon in a villa of a billionaire in Hollywood. It's a long story, but yes, Coke was served. It was served by members of the staff together with champagne. Americans are all equal, but some of them are more equal than others. We believe the global population can quite easily expand to 50 billion people or more and then far beyond that as we ultimately settle other planets. Yes, 50 billion is probably possible, but is it desirable? We now come to the section Becoming Technological Superman, which is just two steps away from the meaning of life, so hold tight. We believe in the romance of technology, of industry, the eros of the train, the car, the electric light, the skyscraper. Okay. We are not primitives cowering in fear of the lightning bolt. We are the apex predator. The lightning works for us. Maybe there was coke of another sort involved. We believe in ambition, aggression, persistence, merit, achievement, bravery, courage, pride, confidence, self-respect. Well, I believe in getting to the point. So let's look at the meaning of life then, according to a Silicon Valley billionaire. We believe technology opens the space of what it can mean to be human. That was a bit underwhelming. What's next? The enemy. Ah, here we get to the real beef people. Our present society has been subjected to a mass demoralization campaign for six decades against technology and against life under varying names like existential risk, sustainability, ESG, sustainable development goals, social responsibility, right, fuck social responsibility, stakeholder capitalism, precautionary principle, trust and safety, tech ethics, risk management, degrowth, the limits of growth, and so on. This demoralization campaign is based on bad ideas of the past, zombie ideas, many derived from communism. Sure, it's all the communists' fault. Our enemy is the ivory tower. Wait, what? The know-it-all credentialed expert worldview, indulging in abstract theories, luxury beliefs, social engineering, disconnected from the real world, delusional, unelected and unaccountable. I think he doesn't like string theorists. Then there's a long Nietzsche quote and the water is warm. He ends with listing the so-called patron saints of techno-optimism that are three Twitter accounts and then a list of authors he seems to like. In case you've been wondering who might sign such a manifesto, the answer is evidently no one. All right, let me try to make sense of this. Technology is great, but as I said, the origin of progress is really knowledge and not technology. If technology is released on the world without proper knowledge, that can have detrimental effects. We've seen this 
many times and that's why people now ask for precaution and social responsibility because we have learned from our mistakes or at least we pretend we did. Think for example of the Industrial Revolution around the turn of the 19th century. It was driven by the burning of coal and the production of metal. It caused air and water pollution that killed and sickened a lot of people. This story has repeated many times with the production of chemicals, leaded gasoline, the rollout of medicines and procedures whose safety hadn't been established and so on. Technology is great. It's also dangerous. Now you could say, well, that's the free market and that's the most efficient way of doing it. And that's great if you're the guy making money from other people's deaths. But you know, not everyone likes that. If a society progresses, for many people, it's not just the goal that matters. The way to reach that goal also matters. And that's why many nations, infuriating as that might be for venture capitalists, ask that you please not unleash technologies that could kill us all. I also find it somewhat disingenuous to throw together quite reasonable requests for risk management with degrowthers and the entire capitalism is bad crowd who are indeed enemies of progress overall. So what have I learned from this? Basically, it seems that the move fast and break things philosophy is still alive in Silicon Valley and uh, that rich Americans still blame the communists for everything they don't like. As you can see, it's not easy to be well informed. This is why I'd like to encourage you to have a look at Ground News, which has really helped me make sense of news and has also helped me save time. Ground News is a news platform that provides you with a lot of extra information that you don't find in the standard media. Take for example this headline about how political ads on social media are rife with misinformation and scams. Ground News will collect all articles about this and will tell you right away that this basically hasn't been covered by the political right. You also get a factuality rating for each news item and it tells you whom the media outlets are owned by and where the news has appeared. It's a really great overview all in one place. Ground News also has the dashboard called My News Bias, which tells you what sources you are looking at yourself and whether whether you lean left or right, what locations of the news you've read or their factuality. It really helps me to become more conscious about my reading habits. If you want to give it a try yourself, use our link ground.news slash Sabina so they'll know I sent you. This will get you a big discount on their Vantage plan with access to all their features. So go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.